Aloha, I'm Wendy Lowe, and today we're taking your health back, streaming live from our studios from Think Tech Hawaii in downtown Honolulu and from my home office in Makiki. Let's be frank with Frank Ferrante, the transition, oh, the transformational star of an award winning documentary entitled May I Be Frank. Aloha, Frank Ferrante, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. Hello, aloha, Wendy. Nice aloha, to meet you. Aloha, aloha. You know, I know you love to talk, and I know we could spend hours just talking about the before Frank, because I want people to know this is the after transformational Frank. So I would like you to share with us a little bit about the before Frank, the before your transformation. What were you like? Well, there it depends on how before we're talking about. If it's before, before. <laughs> um, um, I, I guess not unlike most, a lot, not like most people, people go through different phases in their lives. I mean, mm -hmm. so my experience was just briefly, uh, came, I was born, uh, uh, in New York city. Uh, my parents were immigrants. They came to New York after the, after world war II in 1947. And, uh, my childhood was was very violent. There's a lot of violence in my childhood, uh, both in the streets and uh, the. You know, I experienced uh, a lot of, uh, for want of a better term, religious violence through the Catholic Church. Um, my parents were also traumatized from the war, so there was a lot of fighting in the house, and uh, so I was always, as a kid, trying to figure out how to navigate through that. Um, I always thought as a child, I thought that there was that if I could just find the right formula, I could make this all this fighting stop and figure out peace. And so I started reading at a very young age because I, I thought there was a code that could break this. And and so you sort of sometimes in life, you, you're you, to find a piece of gold. You got to stand in mud for a while, you know, the whole lotus metaphor. And uh, as a result, I, I really got very, um, became very intellectually curious and, and just read a lot as a kid, trying to figure out that formula. But it sort of opened me up to this world of, of literature and, and reading. And I thought there had to be another world outside of this one. Uh, by the time I was an adolescent, I started using drugs. And that was a really immediate way of getting out of my reality. And what I discovered after many, many, many years of drug use and then recovery was that that was, what I was yearning for was that sense of connection with everything. Um, people describe this feeling in many different ways. They have a religious way of describing it or metaphysical way of describing it. My, my experience has, it's my, um, my development has been experiential. And so when I when I finally uh, when I went through the whole everything that goes goes down with the the drug use the problem with it is I think most people that are using drugs are self medicating mm -hmm. the, the the problem with that is whatever trauma generated that that way of being gets compounded with the trauma of the lifestyle mm -hmm. so you know so so um, getting out of it is really challenging but I did and but not using drugs was just was it was just a very very bare beginning of wow. the journey to self to self actualization and real you know realizing who i was and and um i think that my i what i tell people is my recovery didn't necessarily start with putting down the drugs and the alcohol where my recovery started was shortly after i stopped using it was a crushing moment where i realized in technicolor how my behavior was affecting other people, how it was affecting my children, how it was affecting my friends, how it was affecting my life everywhere. The, the people that were getting hurt because of my, uh, my, for want of a better term, laziness for not you know, taking care of myself. And, and that moment was, was really very, you know, just to facing that moment was very painful. And to me, that's when I started, I was at the foot of Everest and that's where I began cleaning up my side of the street, correcting whatever I could correct, uh, re rekindling the, the warmth in relationships that had, that had gone cold, um, uh, reconnecting in a really meaningful 
and loving way with my children, all that stuff. And, and, uh, and then ultimately the road to forgiving myself. Wow. You know, um, that, that's kind of a nutshell. Wow, that's a, that's a big nut. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a big nut. <laughs> yeah, it's a big nut. But you know, how blessed are you that you can look back and you can come to these realizations? You know, and that's the prayer for, um, we work with so many people here in Hawaii and I, I'm sure all over the world with such addictions and struggles. And um, sometimes we just can't help them to reach the point that you reached. And so, wow, this is a, a success transformation. And I'm just so excited that you get to share this, that it's real, you're real, and that it can be done. So, you know, I, I'd just like to, for you to just talk a little bit more about some of your other, your, your struggles in your later life. Well, the, the, I think my, I, one of the things I discovered uh, that was very disturbing is I'm not that unique. Yes. <laughs> I wanted to be a special case. I was very disappointed when I found out I had O positive blood. You know, I wanted AB negative or something. I, you know, I, I don't think that my struggles are much different than anyone else's except that a an interval of those struggles was caught on, on videotape in the film. Mm -hmm. And to me, the film is a tool. What the film demonstrates um, is something similar to the four minute mile. Prior to breaking the four minute mile, that was this, this ideal. And once the four minute mile was broken, next thing you know, that year, it was, it, it, you know, it's not, not, it's not a big deal now. It's been broken many, many times. The film, the film reflects possibilities. I don't change anybody. I don't have that power. I don't want that responsibility. But what I can do, and this is part of my, you know, part of my redemption, is all of those things that that I engaged in when I was using and just being crazy and um, being able to use that experience to reach other people. So I have a language. It was you know, through those experiences. Exactly. And, but exactly. but if, if I didn't have that, I don't really, I, I think I would, I don't know if I'd have a desire even to live. The idea that all of that stuff wasn't necessarily a waste of time. No, it wasn't. Because you I needed can, those steps. Yeah, I, yeah th did. that took a long time to accept. I mean, but yeah. the, the, the fact that I can, you know, I can use that to, uh, be of service um, at least it wasn't all to me at least it wasn't all a waste of time no it was not not a waste not a minute of your life up to the point where we are today but I'm just going to ask you one quick question and we'll move on back then did you like yourself no okay no <laughs> right. no of you course weren't not. happy and you actually were wanting change but maybe you just didn't know how to find it or or get it I was lost. Yeah, I, I definitely was was lost, and I was, you know, that's like that that country song. I was looking for love in all the wrong right. places. Right. But, huh? the, but the thing is, the love that I was searching for was the sense of belonging mm -hmm. and connection to everything. Which, right. which, which, um, because when you when you what happens is when you feel a break from that connection, you start trying to control things around your life that you don't have any control over. Right. Uh, and you start acting. You start acting in ways that are not in your best interest, and don't um, don't contribute to the possibility of unity. Right. Wow. So you know we've got to move on, but I want to just get up to the point where I know you were you're going out for lunches and things, and you find yourself in this restaurant called Cafe Gratitude. Right. And I love that name. Of course, everybody does. It's a raw food vegan restaurant. Were you a vegan back then or even thought? No, I, I didn't know what vegan, I thought vegan was a planet. I didn't know anything <laughs> about it. And the reason I went in there in the first place uh, was because uh, in, in the 12 step world, um, gratitude is a central virtue. And one of our mm -hmm. sayings is a grateful heart will not drink. And mm -hmm. so I thought somebody from AA was being very clever with the name of a coffee shop. I didn't know uh. what it was. I just saw this sign from a distance and I, and I went in there expecting to have coffee with a bunch of recovering addicts and alcoholics. Oh, and instead it was this like vegan restaurant, you know? Mm -hmm. And so they had been thinking that they wanted to, they had this idea of doing a film that was the opposite of supersize me, mm. but um, they couldn't find, uh, they couldn't find a, a candidate, a subject. 
because who walks into raw food vegan restaurants? <laughs> you know, white skinny white guys with dreadlocks. You know, and uh, and a, and, a, and a hemp tunic. You know, right, right. And, and all of a sudden, this like half a gangster <laughs> Italian guy lum, lum, lumbers into this place, saying, "Hey, WTF? What kind of place is this?" And uh, but I but I liked the warmth. They were very warm, right? right. And, and I was very very lonely, and so. I started hanging around there, not because I was so interested in food or transformation <laughs> or anything. It was because I, I liked the people. They, when, when I was that overweight, when I was obese, um, you don't feel seen. You just, people just see this at this exterior. Right. And it's very lonely. And right. I felt like these people were actually seeing beyond the, the, the exterior. Wow. And I didn't know that at the time, but in retrospect, that's that's what I think I was you know what I was experiencing and so I continued to go back there and then they finally one day came to my table and they said you know that movie supersized me I said yeah well we want to do the opposite we want to take somebody who's not well uh, which was a generous description of my condition at the time mm -hmm. and feed him this food for x amount of time and we want to film it and we want you to be the guy and I didn't think anything of it. You know, they didn't know anything about movies or film. They didn't even have a camera. Um, <laughs> nobody knew anything. So the other thing that the film is a testament to idealism, that you have an idea that you feel in your heart or your soul. And, and uh, if you keep it there, you know, because if you, you go to your brain, it's like, oh, well, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? How are we going to do this? And you get lost in the mire of that thinking. Well, these guys were very young. They weren't neurotic like that. They just said, wait, we have an idea. We, you know, we can do this. Next thing you know, things started falling into place. They got a, ca wow. a camera fell out of the ceiling and, you know, and, and, and uh, people showed up. And, and before you, know, you knew it, you were a virtual reality. Before I knew it, these guys were following me with a camera all the time. Oh, my gosh. But it, so you know, it, was, it was one of those smaller... You know, small cameras with the little miniature cassette video. Right, tape. back in the day, right? Yeah, so I mean, the, the the microphone was. We went to they went to Home Depot, bought <laughs> PVC pipe, and taped duct tape a microphone at the end of that. I love it. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> so you 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 talk story with them. They got you to film, and you commit to forty two days on their program, right. and right. they're following you along this transformation like a reality show. That must have been hilarious for you. Well, yeah, I mean, I had, we, none of us had any idea of what we were doing. And, <laughs> and I normally never use this type of language, um, but it was divinely inspired, divinely guided and inspired what because we didn't know what we were doing. Right. We didn't have the vision that came about. The, that last the film that's out now, there were a number of incarnations before it was, before it was, it was um, molded to that, to that, you know, that sequence. Which, by the way, I, I watched it again a couple of, about a couple of years, maybe two years ago, and realized that we unwittingly put the 12 steps together in order. The film is the 12 wow. steps. In, and nobody, I was the only guy in recovery. Nobody <laughs> knew that. But I'm looking at it, and here's this guy. He admits he's got a problem. You know, he admits his life is unmanageable. He believes there's a way out, but he doesn't see it. He turns his life and his will over to the care of these guys. Right. Then he starts exploring his in, you know, internal life and, you know, goes through that difficulty, you know, then starts making them, you know, makes some, makes some, makes a list, makes amends. And then ultimately uh, the, going around the country and the world talking about, you know, doing service with the film. I mean, wow. it's really quite amazing, you know, and all of it, we, none of us had, you know, we had very little money. I mean, Right. I mean, there was no, no, I mean, no money at all. And so, so um, I understand that they followed you all over the place and they put together this um, video. Including the bathroom. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that was the best part. But um, so they put together, unbeknownst of anyone, the 12 step program. So that made it even more successful. But when was the first time that you saw the documentary? Well, the first time I saw it was, it was in post. I mean, it was, it was in a closet. The tapes were in a closet for at least two or three years because we didn't know how to edit. Um, and this guy shows up and he, and he 
you know, he, uh, from, he moved from New York to San Francisco and he met the three guys, my friend Greg Marks, and um, they told him there that years ago they had shot this film. And he said, well, can I take a look at it? And they went to the closet and took out the shoebox and <laughs> blew the dust off of it. And Greg t- <laughs> took the tapes and he reviewed, reviewed a, a number of tapes uh, that evening. And in the morning called us up crying, saying, do you guys have any idea of what you have here? And we didn't. And so he says, I'd like to commit to editing this film. And he put the music to it. He edited it along with my friend, uh, uh, Jeff Lamont, uh, who was a professional editor as well. And and then when the first time I saw it, I I had never seen it before. They called me up and they said, where the film is ready. And I said, what film? (laughs) <laughs> I, I I had forgotten about it, you know, because it had been a couple of years. Right. And when I saw it, I, I was fetal for two weeks. Wow. I mean, imagine you probably have in your photo collection a photograph or two that when you look at it, you cringe. Right. But you keep it because there's somebody you love in it or something. Right. When you look at it, you think, oh, my God, I look like I look you know, terrible. Wow. Well, imagine that for 90 minutes in Technicolor with a sound. <laughs> And larger than life. And on the big screen, <laughs> yeah. right, with other people watching. <laughs> and, and, and you don't look like that or feel like that anymore. No, and, and, and the not. thing is, you know, people <laughs> say, well, you were very brave to do that. No, the film didn't take any courage. What took courage is exposing that. <laughs> <It's watching. laughs> That's what took the courage. Because wow. you know, I didn't think anything of it when they were filming. There was nobody around. For sure, for sure. You know, and it doesn't surprise me that this documentary won or wins so many awards so please tell us about winning the best documentary award well i mean in various film festivals you know uh, um it, it was all bewildering to me i mean I, <laughs> when i first started going around and and going on stage i was in graduate school i i was i was working i i got, we got my, i got my high school diploma when i was 50 because i was a carpenter in my other life and i hurt myself and i thought well, I, I love history and geography, and, and, and I thought, well, I'll become a high school history teacher. And I, at 50 years old, got my high school diploma, then I got my, you know, got my d- a degree in history from UCSB, and then I went on for a graduate uh, degree in humanities in uh, San Francisco State, which is where I met the guys. I was in graduate school, going to be a history teacher. Instead, wow. I became a different kind of teacher. Yeah, uh, and, amazing. And, uh, but... but you know, there, there I was, and standing in front of people that are looking at me like I know something, and I just felt like an <laughs> imposter for the first couple of years. I thought I'd go back to my hotel room after a screening, thinking, sitting at the corner of my bed wow. with my head in my hands, thinking, oh, my God, they're going to find me out. And then, no. then what do I do? I'll have to kill myself, you know? Oh, they found and so, you out. This is so, your Not realizing, yeah, that they did, but, you yeah. know, I, I just, you know, I didn't feel like I had a right to be on stage talking to people about the mind, body, spirit. No, to, you had every you know, right. To, you earned that right. You, well, you but at the, time, I, at the time, I didn't, and I had the imposter syndrome. You know? No, no. Hey, Frank, you know, we have a question from our viewer. Um, they want to know, we all don't have a cafe gratitude in our neighborhood. Right. How does one get started to just even think to change your lifestyle and their eating habits and what would you recommend? Well, the, the, the first thing when any, whenever I talk to anybody, I, the, 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 you, need, you need to have an open mind and you, you have to have willingness and an open mind. Yes. And, and if you really have those things, you, you start out with that, that intention, then somehow the universe conspires yes. to help you. And it doesn't mean that you don't have setbacks and it doesn't mean that you won't, there won't be challenges. Because if, if it were easy, everybody would do it. If it were easy, everybody would do it. And, right. um, and so if you look for, it's, it's, if you look for um, the solution, mm-hmm. uh, you'll find it. And, and I'm not trying to be like simplistic about it because it doesn't mean that that's easy. Mm-hmm. But if you have a desire to change your life, uh, change meaning you got to define your terms too. Like to me, I, you know, I just, I wanted to have peace of mind. That was the, the gold standard for me. It wasn't the money or, or even the relationship. It was, God, I just wanted some peace of mind. Right. I would wake up with the, with the snakes and the scorpions in my head. Um, 
and so peace of mind was like you know the you know the gold as i said the gold standard of my right. desire well, and, you had a uh, goal and you you found your goal and you you reached it and so and, that well it, it, it it's it's a practice it's not so much a goal as a practice you know mm -hmm. happiness is a result of certain decisions that you make and peace of mind is a result of practices that you incorporate into your life right you know, you um, know i i know that when you were going through your addictions your relationship with your daughter your family especially your daughter was very strained are things better yeah. now for you and mia well it, it's I, I talk to my daughter regularly I talk to my son fairly regularly i talk to her more than him he's it's just he's he's the guy so he's out doing what he's doing <laughs> but um um yeah my relationship with my daughter is actually quite beautiful oh, and, i can see and, that uh, i feel it and and uh you know i think that uh you know f families all families have challenges you know mm -hmm. all, families, all families all families you know yes. and especially the ones that from the outside look perfect <laughs> <laughs> you know, beyond that white picket fence. <laughs> That's the next story. There, there's a story. <laughs> yeah, there is. So, you know, in the movie, I know that you, you told the guys from the beginning, that, you know, Frank, what do you want most out of life or what do you want to accomplish? And all you could say was, I just, I want to fall in love one right. more time. And even back then, right when in the, the beginning of your transformation, I even just felt your heart there. And so that's that's a lot of drive. That's a big statement. So I know that that had a lot to do with your journey. I just want to fall in love one more time. Well, and so we want I, to know, I, has it happened yet? I, I think, you know, yeah, yes. And <laughs> I would, I want to you know, add to that, that when I said that, you know, I, I you know, it, it was, um, it was, the, it was the best language I could come up with. Mm -hmm. What I realized was that, that the, the falling in love part was feeling connected yes. to you know to the universe uh and to you know to everyone and and although i have a you know there's somebody you know there's uh, there's definitely love in my life i have a a wonderful wonderful relationship but beyond that it's the idea of being in love with everybody right, right. that's that's like the aspiration it's not a goal but when you go to the supermarket to share eye contact with you know share contact with everyone you meet mm -hmm. so that you can because it's also you know it's 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 not it's not oh what a wonderful person am i i just feel great when that happens right. if i'm talking to somebody and i make them laugh or if i see them smile or you know if i'm doing something to help promote unity on my humble level then you know that i feel i i just i'm not thinking about myself i'm not thinking right. about my past or the future right. Or I'm not thinking about what's wrong with me. In that moment, I'm connecting soul to soul. And right. whether it's and the dentist key. or the paper, that's the guy that's so packing the, the groceries, it's right. all the same soul. Right. We all need that. We're humans. We need touch. We need love. We right. need connection. Right. Hardwired for it. Yes, hardwired for it. So wow, I'm so I'm so overjoyed for you that you know you're on this journey and that you can share the steps that you went through and other people can feel it and pray that they uh, can achieve it as well. Um, you know, as I was uh, researching uh, wh where you're at right now, I see that you have so many videos out. And of course, you have to practice what you preach. So I watch many of your on site visits to many vegan raw foodist restaurants. And boy, you love to cook or looks like you love to cook and you love to eat it too. So I just want to know, do you like to experiment with new recipes? Oh, yeah, definitely. I when we were uh, we were in, in Italy recently and uh, yes. it was a food fest a couple of times a day. It was wonderful. I mean, um, yeah. And the thing is, it's not just the food. I mean, if you uh, if you watch some of the better um, food shows, um, it's really about the connection with, yes. with the, the, you know, like the word. Uh, companion, for example, from the Latin, it means to break bread in union. Yes. Um, and and you know when we break bread, it's, there's we have a there's a commonality that that uh, that's shared, especially if it's shared you know, joyfully. And I 
I would have dinners in Italy. It was like old school stuff, like the whole family's there. And I know, it looks so green. Yeah. All, these, all these people and talking yeah. about this and about that. And within the same evening, which mm. and those meals would take two, three, four hours. And sure. within the conversations, there would be laughter and sometimes somebody would start uh, crying, reminiscing about something. And it was singing. A, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and singing. There's a full range of, uh, of, uh, of emotions. And so the, it, there was, a, 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 there was a, a satisfaction that went down to the, the molecular level. Like it yeah. wasn't just about eating. I mean, we're, in, right. this, in our country, you know, we don't make room or time for that. This, a half hour lunch, how vulgar oh. is that? Yeah, that's the right lunch. word. How vulgar is that? Well, I mean, really, wow. how insensitive and vulgar. A ha not to mention the all-you-can-eat restaurant. Oh, that's I mean, what is that? You know, yeah. it's like, no. it reflects a, for punishment, man, and then well, it's, 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 it, it, reflects, it reflects a, a particular kind of or level right. of consciousness, right? You, you know, know, that's amazing, Frank. But you know, I know, um, I know that you found a lot of you know family relationships and everything, and I also see that you found some time to to volunteer in your community. And I'm sure when I see your face, that brings you much joy. So just tell us about really quickly the vol volunteerism in your community. At, at well, I, I do a little bit of this and that. And um, I, I recently, um, last year, started a hospice mm -hmm. um, volunteering. And partly what, was, what drove me to do that, I woke up one morning and realized that it was just a random thought that I realized, wow, I... I was afraid of my own mortality. It was was bothering me. It was frightening me. And I and then the next thought was, well, okay, well, what do you do about it? Well, I guess you start working with dying people. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, what I realized was, uh, dying is safe. You know, it's safe. Dying is safe. Um, and and um, and I realized um, I'd like to. I know how I want to go. I, I'm just certain of how I don't want to go. And right. fortunately. You know, while I have the capacity to make that choice, I will make it. And right. uh, but um, uh, when you're working with when you're working with people that are you know, that are in transition, you realize you're you're viewing a trailer, a preview of your own process, yes. right? You're wow. guaranteed that process. And so now, I mean, because in our culture, in our society, we're really we're very much insulated from that. It used to be. You were insulated from that experience. It used to be when people died, they would the wake would be in the house. Right. Actually, right. The, that's how coffee the tables. The whole process was at home. Right. And the family came together. Right. To exactly. Enjoy that experience, and right. I say enjoy that experience. Well, you share you know? that experience, and you share it, but right. you must enjoy it because it's just a cycle of life, and what we need to do with our loved ones and share right. every moment, the last breath, with them. Well, but, I, yeah, I mean, the depth, you know, I, I don't know about enjoying, but the depth of the grief is directly proportional to the depth of the love. Right. And that's why exactly. people are afraid of jumping into the pool of love because of the fear <laughs> of the grief. Right. But, you know, Frank, we've come to the end of our show. Oh, I'm so okay. sorry. So All right. I know we have to leave it for there and there for now, Frank. I know I want to have you back when we have time for you Anytime. and you have time for us. So you've been watching Think Tech Hawaii um, and taking your health back. Mahalo to Frank Ferrante for talking story with us and just being frank with us about addictions and his struggles as he finds love, which is aloha. So we want to say aloha to all of you for now and mahalo to Frank. Aloha.